Well, let's talk about sacraments in the Baptist tradition for a moment. Um, there has been for a long time a mischaracterization uh, about Baptists. And number one, they're all lumped together, and that's not fair because all Baptists don't believe the same thing, um, especially those who trace our, the roots of our Baptistic beliefs to uh, those particular Baptists in the 17th century. Uh, Reformed Baptists really don't believe the same thing regarding baptism as your average Baptist. And so many people don't know that. Many people uh, don't realize that. Even Presbyterians, my, my, uh, what I've seen is that, that most Presbyterians do not understand the Reformed Baptist position, covenantal position, regarding baptism. They just don't. Um, and so they just lump us together with, with all Baptists. They say that we just believe that baptism is a profession of faith. And so we're continually, it's, it's happening even now. Some of y'all probably know about some of the internet controversy and mess that's going on because accusations have been made to Baptists that we have contributed to the transgender problem with expressive individualism and that Baptist theology leads to that. Um, and, and, and that's just exegetically indefensible, uh, historically ignorant um, it's, it's, it's dishonest regarding our, uh, confessions and what we, what we believe, um, if someone knows about that and still gives that accusation. So I, I don't want to get into all of that, but I, I do want to give some, uh, defense or explanation for what a, a Baptist covenantal perspective is regarding baptism. And I've been, uh, doing a series on Baptist covenantalism in our children in our church for, for the last two weeks. And we got one more week on that. But I'm gonna I wanna say something here that's not in those sermons and that I haven't really talked about and just kind of give an additional clarity here. What is the Baptist view of the sacrament? And the very fact that I'm using the word sacrament should show that we what I'm talking about here is not what most Baptists would say, because many Baptists think the word sacrament is some sort of curse word. It's some sort of it's just a Catholic word or something. And, and here I am using it. And I'm using it because uh, the London Baptist, Second London Baptist Confession, 1689, use it. All these early Baptists use it. And I think they use it rightly and biblically. And so, for example, um, you have, uh, well, let me say this as well. The, all, all Reformers and Puritans understood this, that the church is made of uh, the word and sacrament. A right preaching of the word and right administration of the sacraments. And, and, and then the church is more than that, but never less than that. And so all Reformed churches hold highly the word of God and hold highly uh, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And so uh, R William Kiffin, who, who he was born in 1616, uh, they call him the father of particular Baptists. Um, he was, uh, he, he once said that this, this, the sacrament of spiritual birth is baptism. That baptism is the sacrament of spiritual birth. I agree with that. Uh, he was actually arguing with someone one time and he said, uh, baptism is the first sacrament of the New Testament in which there is an exact analogy between the sign and the thing signified. Uh, Hercules Collins, who was rightly named, this man was no coward, he wrote a pamphlet, um, just to give you a feel of how, uh, how bold this man was, it, it called Believer's Baptism from Heaven and Divine Ordinance, Infant Baptism from Earth, a Human Ordinance. Uh, man was, was uh, not scared of controversy. But he said this, The sacraments are signs and seals set before our eyes and ordained by God. So the sacraments are signs and seals from God. Okay, that, that's significant. Most Baptists don't say that. Um, and, and many people don't understand that Baptists believe that. Well, here it is. Um, there are signs and seals ordained by God for this cause that he may declare and seal by them the promise of his gospel unto us. Did he not give it freely, the remission of sin and, and everlasting life? And not only to all in general, but to everyone in particular that believes in the only sacrifice of Christ that he accomplished on the cross. So clearly, these 
early Baptists are saying some, that baptism is more than just your profession of faith. Okay, It's more than just your individual decision to enter into the new covenant. All right? We believe God's promise is there. His promise is there with signs and seals. There's God is doing something in baptism more than just what that individual is professing. All right. And, and so there's three things that, that, that he says God is doing. I don't want to make sure we're clear on these. Number one, in the act of baptism, there is a sign. God is there with his sign. Death, burial, resurrection. That's the sign. That's why we immerse. Death, burial, resurrection. It's pictured in the sign. And it's a reality that those who uh, are being baptized have died with Christ, have been buried with him, and raised to newness of life, Romans 6 says. Right? Additionally, the seal of the Spirit is there. It, the, that uh, There is such a close connection. Many of you have read your Bibles enough to see these New Testament passages where you'll see baptism, and then right connected with it is the Spirit. So, for example, um, Acts 2 is where this shows up first. Peter's preaching, and he says, Repent and be baptized every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you've got the Holy Spirit and baptism and repentance all together, right? And then Paul builds that out later, and he connects those two things. And so um, Reformed Baptists have said that you have, you have uh, the baptism of the Spirit, which is regeneration, happening with faith and repentance, and the act of baptism of a believer, happening simultaneously together so that they need to be connected. The Bible connects them. We must connect them so that the sign and the thing signified, uh, as Kiffin said, are, are one. They're happening together. It's the, an exact analogy between the sign and the thing signified. I think that's right. Historical Baptists have seen the seal of the Spirit there at baptism. Thirdly, the promise there is a promise from God at baptism. We agree with Presbyterians about that. Presbyterians would say that baptism is a promise. We agree. We agree. But what New Testament passages teach that? Right? And, and so many would point to Colossians 2.11, where the, it talks about circumcision and baptism together, but it actually says circumcision of the heart, which is regeneration. So... The physical sign of circumcision in the Old Covenant is fulfilled in regeneration, circumcision of the heart. And you say, well, what's the precursor to baptism? Well, uh, that would be the ceremonial washings and cleansings from the, the Levitical priests before they offer the sacrifices in the temple and do their ministry in the temple, those sacrificial cleansings and washings. Therefore, Jesus at his baptism, what is he doing? He's not just giving an example for us. He's receiving his priestly, high priestly cleansing before doing his covenant work. His priestly work of ministry before that three-year ministry. He's cleansing. He's fulfilling the type. That's the historic uh, Baptist position. Uh, there needs to be some argument toward that if somebody doesn't want to uh, agree with that. But that's clearly not saying what, what Presbyterians are saying, that circumcision and baptism are connected. That's a, a Reformed Baptist would not think that's a biblical connection. And then the other passage that's significant is Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 38 and 39, where Peter uh, says, This promise is for you and your children, which uh, many love to say, see, there it is, there's the promise, your kids are going to be saved um, this is a promise that they will one day be saved. But the verse goes on. It says, this promise is for you and your children and those who are far off and any whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So not only the unconverted Jews he's preaching to, which it's important to remember Peter's preaching to unconverted Jews, who just a few days before that said, uh, his blood be upon us and our children as they're crying out for Christ to be crucified. They brought a curse on themselves and their children. Uh, that's Matthew 27, 25, and then Peter's going, that curse you brought upon you and your children, God's willing to forgive it. This promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off and any who the Lord our God would call to himself. So any elect, any who would receive 
Christ by faith, sins forgiven. Enter into the new covenant. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. That's that's the promise. And, you know, and there's... I, I love the points of unity that, again, Presbyterians and Baptists have when it comes to the Old Testament and how it's prefiguring baptism. So many times... Uh, many theologians will point out like uh, Noah in, in the ark that the floods of judgment came and they passed through the judgment and came out to new life or Israel going through the Red Sea and they're, they're going through the Red Sea as it's parting and they enter through the judgment, the waters of judgment and they immerse to salvation and new life and they would say that's a type of baptism, that's a precursor to baptism and I would agree. I would say, if anything, it's a, it's a precursor to believer's baptism because they willingly went into the waters of judgment and, and came out uh, to new life. But uh, again, that's not... Uh, here. Samuel Renahan said something really significant in his book, The Mystery of Christ, uh, His Covenant, and His Kingdom. And listen to what he, he said here. Baptism is a two-way declaration. On the one hand, it's God's visible promise to all those who are in His Son are new creations by virtue of their union with Christ in His death and resurrection. On the other hand, it is the individual's profession of faith in those promises. And then I would add, it's also the church affirming that they believe there's evidence that that person has been buried with Christ, raised to new life, received God's promise, um, and they're taking their profession of faith as legitimate. The church is involved in that. This is a church ordinance. And so, yes, the church can be wrong about who they baptize, no doubt. Acts chapter 8, you've got Simon the magician, the church baptized him, and he was a false convert. But I don't think the guilt falls upon the church for taking him at his profession of faith. I think the guilt is on Simon the magician for falsely claiming he was submitted to the lordship of Christ when he wasn't. And, but even, look, even when there's, there's going to be false baptisms in the, in the sense that you baptize someone, you put the seal upon them, the promise upon them, um, and they haven't really been buried with Christ and raised to new life. That happens. But that doesn't take away from the fact that it, uh, from those that it really has happened. Those who truly are regenerate and they, they have received the sign and the seal and the promise. That is God promising them. That really is the church affirming objectively, uh, we believe God has done this work in you, and that really is that person making their public profession of faith, showing their own volitional uh, surrender to the Lordship of Christ and trust in, in, in Christ's atoning work for them. Um, and that's significant, and we don't want to do anything to downplay this glorious sacrament of baptism. Guys, hope that's helpful. Bring some additional clarity uh, to some of this. Blessings.